today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 2 and a closer look at certain aspects of creation and particularly those things that have to do with what man is doing when he is created and just after he's created and of course the creation of woman which is a monumental moment in the early history of our world and so we'll be commenting on those things today. So first thing I'm going to do, which I meant to do in our last lecture, is just to go ahead and read the whole chapter so that we all kind of have it in our minds, and then I'll go back and make comments. All right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work, and he had done, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Hivalah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The bdellium and the onyx stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now this is a fascinating passage and there is a lot to comment on. There's far too much probably for us to cover in the level of detail that it deserves, but we're going to try. The first thing that you might notice is that the first three verses don't seem to fit in chapter 2. It seems like they should be the bookend for the end of chapter 1. Now, if you don't know this already, it'd be good for it to be mentioned that the chapters and verses that we have in the Bible were not originally there. They were placed later, a a great time later, and uh, they're very helpful because they allow us to uh, refer to certain sections of the massive text of the Bible and be able to find those with precision. And it's even easier now with computer technology and smartphones and things like that. But the verses and chapters were at numbers were added later, and they they are not what we would consider to be inspired the way that the text is. This is also true of some of the um, headings of different chapters, and even some of the names of the books of the Bible and things like that. And that's important because one example would be in. Um, the book of Revelation, many Bibles say 
as a as a heading for the or as a rather for a name for the book we'll say the revelation of uh, saint john the divine or the revelation of saint john or the revelation of john uh, the apostle when in fact if you just read the opening verses of the book of revelation it actually says that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you, you can see that these things are not inspired, and the chapters and verses are also not inspired. And if it had been up to me, I think I would have bookended chapter 1 with the first three verses of chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. Nevertheless, here they are in chapter 2, and they tell of the last day of creation. So let's read them again and then comment on them. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now, this is obviously still um, a passage that we should recognize, but it's also a passage that causes a lot of controversy in today's world among religious people. There are certain people that think that um, the Sabbath day, the seventh day, um, is a, a holy day still for the church in the sense that the, the church, if they were doing what they ought to do, would be worshiping on the seventh day rather than on the first day of the week. And in not doing this, they're actually in sin, and they're actually uh, denying something that was commanded by God that we do. Now, uh, let's think about this for a minute. Why would someone say such a thing? Well, um, one reason is because in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, it says this, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work, as God did from his. Now, we know that for in the law, and for those people living under the Mosaic law, there, was, there were certain commandments and certain things related to um, the Sabbath, and uh, they had to observe the Sabbath, and that was very important. However, Jesus fulfilled the law. The question remains, however, that because of a New Testament passage like this, uh, we, we have to ask, is it still the case that Christians living after Jesus has fulfilled the law under the new covenant, are we required to keep this? Really what we're asking is, do we have to keep this ceremonial aspect of the law uh, or rather, is it a ceremonial aspect of the law or is it a moral aspect of the law? You see, those things that are ceremonial in the law are not necessarily binding on Christians. Uh, we normally think of three different um, aspects of the law. There is the ceremonial law, there is the civic law, and there is the moral law. The ceremonial law would be those things that have to do with the aspects of the law that serve as symbols or representations uh, for us today that people had to do. A lot of the things related to the tabernacle and later the temple and um, things that, that you wouldn't have known on your own, you wouldn't have been able to just think about it and, and realize that, that that's something you should do. You had to be specifically instructed that this is something that you should do. For example, um, taking a day of the week, namely the seventh day of all day. I mean, why the seventh day rather than the third day or the fifth day? Uh, why the seventh day? There's nothing intrinsic about the seventh day that you would think, well, I guess I'm, I should, you know, everybody just kind of knows from the time they're able to think about things that on the seventh day, you should reserve that day not to do any work and to worship God. Well, there's nothing intrinsic about that day that tells you that. However, with the moral law, say, for example, not to murder someone, there is something intrinsic about the nature of murder that no one has to tell you that, that you shouldn't do that because that's a part of the moral code. We, we kind of recognize that already. And so the ceremonial law has to do with those symbolic things and often they're things that you have to be told uh, are to be done under the Mosaic law or else you wouldn't have known it otherwise. The moral law has to do with things that are um, of a moral nature. And then the civic laws would be things that have to do with the governance of the people. And so these three different ways of looking at the Mosaic Law help us to categorize and understand things. When we talk about the law having been fulfilled in Jesus, and we recognize that we don't really have to follow certain aspects of the law uh, living under the New Covenant, it's important to note that um, the, the civic aspects of the law sometimes are very helpful for governments who want to set up their own laws and systems. In fact, uh, in America, in the United States of America, certain uh, things that we have in our law books uh, 
make a lot of sense because they're drawn from the Mosaic Law, which was the most perfect law uh, that was ever written. It makes sense to build your law after that if you've got a law written by God, right, uh, under the inspiration of God. So um, the civic law can be helpful, but it's not necessarily something that has, has to be binding for people living in the New Covenant. Um, the ceremonial law, likewise, doesn't have to be binding and, in fact, wouldn't make a lot of sense in a lot of cases. And, of course, in the New Testament, we actually have teaching that um, specifically tells us that we don't have to live under the ceremonial aspects of the law. The moral law, however, represents some principles that represent the principles that God had in mind. And so we would want to follow the moral aspects of the law. So we have to ask the question then, understanding these distinctions, is the keeping of the seventh day something that would be, should be considered a ceremonial or civic aspect of the law, or should it be considered a moral aspect of the law? Well, it shouldn't be considered a civic aspect of the law, so we have to determine between the other two, ceremonial or moral. And that is where the debate often lies. Now, because of one of the guiding parameters that I've given you a moment ago, there's nothing intrinsic about the seventh day that you would have to that you would just know I'm supposed to worship God on the seventh day on your own. You, there's nothing innate about it uh, that we can imagine um, that that makes it that way. In fact, um, for that reason, God had to tell us. In fact, the Bible tells us here in this passage that God actually had to sanctify it. Uh, and and, and uh, make it holy in that in that way. But what do we do about a passage like Hebrews chapter four verse nine that seems to say that for believers there is still this there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God? Well, uh, you know, oftentimes when you're looking at the passage, uh, a verse like this, uh, you can't just cite a proof text and rip it out of its context. We need to see what follows verse nine. And see what comes next. In the next verse, in verse 10 of Hebrews 4, it says, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work. All right? Now, um, th- this tells you, I think, I-, I submit to you, that the context, or, or rather the meaning of, of this, is that um, in-, in Christ, under the new covenant, you rest. Rest from what? Well, rest from work. Rest from the type of work that was necessary before in order to, to uh, be right with the law, so to speak. Now you rest in Christ. That uh, seems to be the meaning. Um, you don't have to go to the temple and make these sacrifices anymore. You don't have to observe circumcision. You don't have to uh, pay a tithe to the temple. You don't have to do all these sorts of things the, that you would have to do before under the ceremonial law. Uh, I think that's what it's teaching rather than uh, teaching something about the nature uh, of a particular day and that it still stands for us. After all, whatever you want to say about the other days of creation, um, this tells you that there still is a Sabbath day of rest, which means this day itself has not was not a 24-hour period. It's a long-standing day that we still find ourselves in, and it's a, it's a period of rest, and we rest now in Christ. Now, just in case anyone thinks, well, okay, so then that means that under the Old Covenant, uh, you had to do these things in order to be quote unquote saved, and um, you know you had to you had to uh, the Day of Atonement. You had to make sacrifices. You had to do all these ceremonial things. Well, you did have to do those things um, in the sense that God wanted them done. But one thing is still true that was always true, and that is that even before, according to Paul in the Book of Romans, even before under the law. Before the law, during the law, and after the law, it has always been the case that you are not that you are justified by your faith. In fact, in Romans chapter four, we find two examples of this in Old Testament biblical characters: one who lived before the law, and one who lived after the law. Uh, the first being Abraham, the second being David. In Romans chapter four and verse one, it says this. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now it's the one who works his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, 
but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Okay, that's Abraham. Now, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? You see that he's making this very point. For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Faith. Faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised. All right, so uh, just wanted to make the point that it has always been the case, nothing has changed in, in this respect, that God is not so much interested in works as he is in your faith. And um, we'll talk about what faith entails maybe as we'll continue this study in other lectures. But it's, um, it's faith that justifies, and it has always been this way. It's been this way before the law, in the law, and then after the law. All right? But uh, what Hebrews is talking about is ceasing from a certain type of work and resting in Christ. And it has nothing really to do with keeping one ceremonial day holy in, in that way. Now, those that want to argue that we should still observe the Sabbath day rather than the first day of the week will often go to Acts chapter 17, verse 2, and passages like it that seem to indicate that Paul worshipped or rather visited the synagogue regularly for example Acts 17 2 says and according to Paul's custom he went to them and for three sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures well uh, it is Paul's custom but nowhere does it say here that Paul was that Paul was trying to go there because he was still trying to observe the Jewish Sabbath instead he was going there because that was where he knew that there were going to be a large number of people that he could have audience with and that he could uh, preach it was a it was for the purposes of, of of reaching others for Christ it wasn't because he saw something intrinsically good about the Jewish Sabbath after the new covenant has begun now there's another side of this coin the other side of this coin is that Christians often will argue that we still do have to observe a particular day of the week as a special holy day. It's just that it's not the seventh day. It's not the Sabbath, specifically speaking, anymore. But now there is a first day of the week Sabbath. Now uh, what has changed is not that we don't observe a particular holy day, but now that uh, that holy day will be on the first day of the week. And the way that they argue this is often based on the fact that we see uh, New Testament believers are doing this, and that the early church, it is believed, uh, did this as well, even after Scripture in the first century, second century, and so forth. Uh, there are passages that talk about things happening on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Okay, so there was evidence there that on the first day of the week, um, there, there were some believers together breaking bread, and um, uh, then maybe some preaching began with Paul. He had a message until midnight. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so, to, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. Now, this does tell us that believers, at least in, in one case, um, or at rather, uh, did seem to have a, a habit of coming together on the first day of the week. Now, the, a distinction needs to be made here between what we see happening in Scripture sometimes and what we can be dogmatic about as a command from Scripture. And um, we, we do see Christians getting together on the first day of the week, and it does look somewhat like services taking place. But in the case of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, what we see there is simply on the first day of the week there to gather um, this offering so that they could uh, use that for purposes that the apostles needed, needed those purposes. Collections were to be taken. In Acts 20, verse 7, we do see um, uh, that... Uh, there were some people that got together, broke bread, that is, they ate a meal, and uh, then there was some preaching, but it doesn't tell us that that had to be that way. 
Um, and so there's no direct command for us. Now, the early church did take this and run with it. Um, there is a, a, a legend that we find in what is known as the Apocalypse of Peter, which does date to the second century AD. But it's but the Apocalypse of Peter is generally thought to be a false uh, writing. But um, it does talk about it. Kind of takes all the things that were true about the Sabbath before, and then migrates that migrates those over to Sunday for believers. Uh, it's likely that this wouldn't have been uh, unusual. I mean, we do see in the New Testament people doing this on doing you know worshiping on the first day of the week, and then it, now we have some second century evidence that this was a practice, even if it was from a false you know false gospel, so to speak. There is mention of it as being a practice and and an admonition that you ought to do this, but there's no command to do this. There's there's nothing uh, com- commanded about it. Well, why make a big deal out of it? Well, one reason to make a big deal out of it is you want to be silent where Scripture is silent. And I think it's fine to speculate. And frankly, I think you should get together on the first day of the week and worship. I'm just not prepared to say that if someone worships on Saturday, as a lot of churches are doing now, um, not because they want to be Sabbatarians, but rather because you know a lot of contemporary churches will have services on Saturday night and then services on Sunday morning. People speak out against this. You know, I prefer to go to church on Sunday morning because I think there's something to be said for tradition, and I do like the uh, the foundation we see in the history of the church on a Sunday uh, worship there. But I can't say that someone who's worshiping on Saturday night rather than on Sunday morning is in sin because of that, because there's nothing in Scripture that commands that they do that. And again, it seems to be trying to hold on to something ceremonial, albeit in a little bit different way, um, that is not a moral or civic part of the law. Uh, the first time that there is a commandment, in fact, even for the law that you follow uh, the Sabbath and that you act differently on the Sabbath than you do on other days, is not in this passage specifically. It's actually later on. It's actually whenever you know uh, after the Exodus, whenever they're talking about collecting the manna, and they're said to not do this on this, the seventh day. So, um, you know, even though it's mentioned here, there's no command here in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. There's no command to do it. In fact, there's evidence that even though God sanctified this day, that it may be that, um, that, that Moses is pointing this out for the people in his time based on what they ought to be doing now. For example, look at the end of the chapter, Genesis chapter 2, in verse 24. It says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So Adam and Eve did not have a mother and father, but Moses is appropriating this lesson about what happened with the original couple and saying, now because of this, now you're to act a certain way. And likewise, he's pointing back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and I think saying, uh, because of what we see here, God resting on the Sabbath day, that he's sanctifying that for you now here to be uh, to function that way going forward uh, in, under the law. Um, so I submit all that to you because I do think it's important to keep these things in mind as we think about um, what it means that we worship on a particular day of the week and uh, whether that's, you know, uh, uh, how, how we should view that. You know, there's a legalism that sometimes creeps into the church, and we want to be careful not to have that legalism. Now, I want to reaffirm to those uh, who might listen to this who are aware of my ministry, I actually think it's a good idea and that there is some basis. There's certainly some biblical basis and certainly basis in church history to, to, uh, to, to have services on um, the first day of the week. But listen... Uh, Jesus is Lord even of the Sabbath, but in being the Lord even of the Sabbath, he's the Lord of Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and even of the Sabbath, <laughs> Saturday, right? Uh, Jesus is the Lord every day. And I think there is a little bit of danger in trying to place uh, you know, uh, t- more emphasis than the Bible places for New Testament believers on a particular day of the week if it gives the impression that, okay, well then, you know, this day is a holy day. The rest of the days are not holy days. The rest of the days are not days that you need to really focus in the same way on serving the Lord. No, he's Lord of every day and every day you should be serving him. Um, again, I do think it's good as a, as a testimony to 
uh, believers going forward and our children that, hey, we love the Lord so much that not only do we serve him every day, but there's a particular day when we actually um, gather specifically in a large group and do certain things. I think that's good. I think tradition is good. We've just got to be careful in how we talk about that tradition. All right, now let's look at verse 4 in more detail. It says this, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. All right, now, and then it tells us that he planted a garden. Now, there's a a little bit of a problem for some people in this. I mentioned in one of our previous lectures that here we see in Genesis chapter 2 a closer look at some things that are happening in Genesis chapter 1. And in fact, this is a little bit bothersome to some people because what you see happening seems to mess with the chronology that is given to us in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1, it tells us that when the dry land appeared, but there wasn't any shrubs yet, was at the beginning part of day 3. Because in Genesis 1, 9, it says, Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation. Okay, And then uh, on day six, we see that man was created, right? So um, we, have to, we have to notice here that there is a mixing of these days or it's, it looks like the chronology is disturbed. Now, how are we to deal with this? What are we to make out of this? Is this a contradiction? Well, one thing you're going to notice as we walk through the alleged Bible contradictions in the Old Testament is that oftentimes when skeptics want to say, well, here's a contradiction, they are assuming a couple of things. They are assuming, number one, that the biblical authors had to look at these things very woodenly and just kind of move through it all in a very literalistic and wooden way and can't be creative in how they arrange the material that they arrange. Um, And so we have to bear that in mind. When you look at the Gospels, for example, in the New Testament, uh, certain Gospel accounts seem to place certain things in different chronological order. Uh, Lots of skeptics have said, well, this shows you that there's some contradictions here. Well, no, it doesn't show you that at all because the Gospels are Greco-Roman biography. And in Greco-Roman biography, it's perfectly appropriate to move. They didn't write biographies the way we do where it has to be more chronological and it has to be such a literal, linear uh, way of understanding a person's life or of looking at history, they had um, usually some particular thing they wanted to say about a person uh, in a biography. And so they arranged the material in a way that was still true, but the chronology and the emphasis would bring out that thing that they wanted to say about that particular person about whom they're writing a biography. And I think if people would understand that, they number one, skeptics wouldn't see a contradiction there, and Christians would not feel like they have to do gymnastics and get into all kinds of contortions in the text to try and find ways to harmonize chronology when you don't really have to do that. You're trying to make um, the way people wrote history in the first century fit the way we write history in the 21st century, and there's just no reason to try and force such a framework on the way they did things then. Um, so having said all of that, uh, there, there, there are ways that we can understand this that I don't think result in a contradiction in any sense. Uh, another reason why is because um, that I don't think this is a contradiction and that we're, it's, it's perfectly, we're perfectly within our rights to look for an explanation that makes sense is also because what you would be saying is that Moses wrote the first Uh, chapter, and then only moments later in writing the second chapter, and remember those chapter headings were added, in the same section of text, he actually contradicted what he wrote just a few, from our perspective, verses above. Now, people could theoretically, if they're not under the inspiration of Scripture, uh, contradict themselves in what they've said, you know, pages later, uh, where they forgot what they said because they're making it all up. 
um, what they said a few pages ago they might contradict or a few chapters ago or something like that. But it's, it's uh, less likely, to say the least, that someone would contradict what they just wrote a few moments ago. Uh, that's another reason. And a, a third reason is that uh, why we shouldn't consider this to be contradictory is that there are different ways of looking at what genre of literature is being written here. So um, I think we're within our rights to look at what makes sense of this. So let's go ahead and think about that for a moment. One explanation that ha has been put forth, obviously, is uh, was mentioned in, in uh, two lectures ago. And that is that... Um, the, Old Earth creationists, or people who take a literary framework, or um, things like that, will not look at this as being woodenly literal. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not taking the Bible seriously, and it doesn't make that mean that they are liberal theologically. It just means that they disagree about what genre of literature is being written. And those people that do that actually affirm the inspiration and the uh, inerrancy of Scripture, but would point to this very fact that we're considering now as evidence that Moses was not trying to give us a literal account of exactly what happened in a chronological way. You know, evening and morning was the first day, evening and morning was the second day. But what, rather, he was, he was doing something else, putting it into a framework, uh, perhaps that they were already familiar with from uh, their understanding of creation, and he's now giving them the truth in that framework. Or uh, it, it could be something else. So, but the fact is, uh, some people will explain it that way. Well, what if someone, though, wanted to take a very literal uh, interpretation, a, you know, more of the traditional, uh, at least recently traditional, young earth perspective on this, and they want to say, well, I do think this is six literal days, and I do think that it's chronological, and I, I think it all just kind of means what it says, quote-unquote, a plain reading of the text. If someone were to take that, how would they how would they explain this? Well, one possibility is that it's not important to give the chronology. You know, just as I mentioned about the Gospels, the chronology one could say was given to you in the first chapter, and now we're not doing chronological teaching anymore, but we're reorganizing the material to teach something specific for, about what man did when he was created with all of these sorts of things. Um, I know that that sounds awkward to you living in the 21st century, but it was not awkward to ancient peoples, and it was perfectly fine. And remember, the Bible was not originally written for 21st century audiences. It was written to the people to whom it was written. And for that reason, it was written in a way that they would understand and that they would be used to, perhaps, uh, to hearing stories and things like that. So, <clears throat> so it could be that that material is just being arranged like that. Another explanation, perhaps, is that um, what we're getting in Genesis chapter 2 is not the creation of all the vegetation or whatever, but rather that we're seeing what's happening in the garden from Adam's perspective, that uh, nothing had sprouted in the garden or not nothing had sprouted in his, in his region. And um, so it's actually an, a little... Uh, a little commentary on the um, the creation of plant life in his region, and then how he dealt with it, and that sort of thing. Um, that that's one that's another possibility. So there are ways you can understand this that don't require you to see this as a contradiction, and I certainly don't think that it is that there is anything contradictory here. We just have to be careful that before we throw the Bible out the window, we ask the question, can it only be understood in this one way? Well, if the one way you're understanding it would lead you to a contradiction, well, then I submit to you, because I believe the Bible is inerrant, that you're understanding it wrongly. All right? Um, so what do we make about the fact that it says here, now look down at... Um, Look down at uh, verse 6. But a mist used to rise from the ground and water the whole surface of the ground. Uh, it tells us in verse 5 that no rain had yet been sent. Now, this leads to the question of how can it possibly be that no rain had yet been sent? Now, it doesn't tell us that rain uh, was not sent until the flood necessarily Although that is something you'll hear people say. You'll say, well, the first rain that came, came with the flood. Um, and uh, from this point uh, going forward, there was a mist that arose from the ground. And some people would say that this mist, you know, that this was uh, above the firmament 
was this layer of, of mists or whatever, and that it, that's what protect, protected people from uh, the harmful you know, uh, elements of the universe. And, and uh, I remember it was, in, I guess, in the early 90s. I, I remember I was very young then, but I do remember <clears throat> hearing then all the, 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 the commotion about ultraviolet rays and all of this. It was you know, uh, frightening people, and the ozone layer is, is decaying and all of that. Well, some people uh, think that there used to be uh, a firmament that protected us and a mist that protected us there and that there was this mist that rose up from the earth and that that's where the plants that needed water got their water and some will even argue that's what accounts for the long lifespans of people because that was a much healthier atmosphere and all of those sorts of things and part of the reason that they will say this is because I mean it's not based on no evidence the Bible does tell us here that there, not, there had not yet come any rain now it didn't tell us right there that no rain came until Noah's day but Hebrews 11, 7 says this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says this, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, some people will say the things not yet seen here refers to rain because it's by virtue of the rain that the floods came. Now, that's not necessarily completely true. Um, floods, the Bible says more about the flood than, than just that. But uh, we have to ask the question, are the things not yet seen the rain? I mean, obviously, the, I take that most obviously and most clearly to mean that the things not yet seen had been the world destroyed by a flood. That's, the, that's what had not yet been seen, right? That the flood came. Um, can we include in that that no rain had ever been seen? I mean, that would it would be true uh, if if things not yet seen referred to both the rain and the flood. Well, that would make sense, but it would likewise make sense to say that things not yet seen meant that rain had come before, but no flood had ever come. Right. So I think this is based on not enough evidence. I don't think you can claim just based on this that um, there had never been any rain because the Bible doesn't tell us that there had never been any rain uh, clearly. It's speculation. Now, by the way, I do think that speculation is fun and it's enjoyable and it can be helpful. And I have a lot of speculations and I usually present those. And I mean, we're talking about this as a presentation of a speculation right now, someone else's speculation. Um, but we got to be careful not to teach our speculations as dogmatically as some people do. You know, some people in talking about end time stuff, they they, they, they compare and they contrast and it's all built, you know, you build this on a really weak framework that has a lot of speculation in it. And it's like, you know, a dog has four legs and a cat has four legs. So a dog is a cat. And then you build something on top of that. You know, it just, it, it gets out of control. I want to be clear when I'm giving you what I think is speculation. And this is what some people think. And it might, it might possibly be true. I, I'm not telling you that it's not true. It may well be that it didn't rain until the flood came. I just don't like it when people get all dogmatic. Um, after all, one other piece of evidence in favor of it is the fact that God uh, gave a rainbow and, and, um, and, and uh, as a sign to them. Well, uh, it could be that we should take from that that um, it never rained before because you get rainbows when you get rain. So I don't know. I submit all of that to you as, as possibility. Uh, let's move forward and keep looking. Now what it says after that, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Um, now, this, uh, this living being, is, you know, uh, the word soul is, is used in some translations, and uh, some people tend to mistake the word soul there for the word spirit that's used in the New Testament. And uh, the word that's used here. Uh, for living being or soul in some translations doesn't have quite the same meaning. It, just, meaning. it just means that God brought this man to life. He put the breath of life into this man. And this man had been a formed uh, being a, um, uh, and now God made him alive. All right. Now, th th it is interesting that uh, God actually, you know, God didn't just speak him into existence. The Lord God formed man of dust. And this seems a little bit special. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, you'll see different words used 
in some places you might you might talk about God making something and then God creating something, and um, uh, there's an idea that that when He's creating something, that's like you know out of nothing or uh, whatever. But then when He when He makes something, it's the using pre-existing materials. But either way, here God forms man out of the dust of the earth. And we can imagine him forming this man so that you have like a like a like the body of man, but not yet what we would call biological life and and alive. Now, believe it or not, some abortionists have tried to square abortion with the Bible by saying, "Well, look, actually, late term abortion or partial birth abortion or maybe full birth. I don't know what you would say, but I have heard of this used to support abortion because the idea is that just as <laughs> And this is really reaching, by the way. Just as man wasn't alive until he actually received uh, breath, you know, he, until he breathed, that, um, that 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 means that no one is really said to be alive or a person until they breathe their first breath of oxygen. And so, for that reason, you could use, they say, this passage to support the idea that a baby in utero, even right up until it's actually born, is not really a person. Uh, because it hasn't taken its first breath. Now that, to me, if you believe that, then I've got some fictitious land in Florida to sell you because that is ridiculous. There are a lot of differences between what happened here with the first man and what happens with a child in its mother's belly. If not the least of which is the fact that before Adam received the breath of life, he was in no sense alive. Right? He was he was formed of dust. He you know, he had not been through a process of gestation. He had not been already receiving amniotic fluid from its mother and all these kinds of things that um and blood and, and you know um oxygen by the way that already comes in to uh the body th- while the child is in utero, um even before it takes its first breath. That is a completely different experience. I mean that that we know for sure, I mean this is beyond question that a child in utero is already experiencing thoughts and, and is contemplating and is feeling pain and all these kinds of things. Whereas Adam, before he received this breath of God, uh, was experiencing nothing. I mean, from the way it's presented here, it appears that it's just a formed man, but but not alive, you know, not in any sense conscious, not in any sense functioning as a, a living organism. And then God breathed breath of life into him and now he's alive. I think that's an important distinction to make between what happened here with Adam and everyone else that has ever been born. It's very, very different. Um, All right, then it says, uh, let's see, uh, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Uh, Out of the garden, the land God caused to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, now, um, one other other possibility that I I didn't mention earlier that would make sense of the chronology being different here of events is that um, uh, it's my understanding, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but it's my understanding that um, the Hebrew verb form that is used for uh, that God made, the, for made there, can just as easily mean had made uh, or had created. So that uh, what, when, when it refers to something in Genesis chapter 2 as God making something, it could mean that he had made it, and now we're looking at it in closer detail. So it could even be the case that God had already made the garden, and now he's putting man in the garden. But regardless of that, we should notice that in this garden, there are particularly mentioned two trees, the tree of life uh, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we get the tree of the knowledge of good and evil gets a lot of attention, but we should say something about the tree of life because um, others have mentioned this, but... Um, you know, we think about the fact that Adam and Eve would have never died in the garden. And we think, oftentimes, we think of it as just because they were not in a fallen state, and so their bodies would have never experienced physical death. Um, and so they, they, they were just immortal. They were just intrinsically immortal before the fall. But remember that whenever the fall happened, God removed them from the garden. 
and would not allow them to come back into the garden. And, and they were going to die as a result of the fall, and they were now outside of the garden. That's interesting, isn't it? And it's because they ate of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it's because they, and yet nothing is said specifically, oftentimes when this is preached on, about now their removal from the tree of life. You know, this seems interesting to me. Is it possible that the tree of life, I'm just suggesting this to you, is it possible that the tree of life is uh, the reason that they would have lived forever? That by virtue of not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but eating of the tree of life, I mean, after all, it's called the tree of life, that that tree of life actually maintained this immortality that they would have had, this ability to live forever. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that's interesting as a, as a possibility. Especially given that this is not the last time we see the tree of life. If you look at Revelation chapter 22 at the other end of the Bible, and verse 1, it says, Then he showed me a river of uh, the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, and yielding her fruit, uh, twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, think about this. You've got a tree of life in the garden that now they, after the fall, will have no access to. In heaven, we're told there will be a tree of life and that it will have fruit every month, 12 kinds of fruit, and that this fruit will actually be for the healing of the nations. Is it possible that uh, in heaven, it will be the case that we will live forever because we will forever eat of the tree of life? And that the reason Adam and Eve would have lived forever is because they would have had access to the tree of life. Um, I'm not insisting upon this explanation. I'm just offering it to you for your consideration, as you'll hear me say quite a bit. But I do think that that's interesting that we have two trees there. Also, I want to say another thing about these two trees that I think is important, and that is that these two trees, it says, are both in the midst of the garden. It's as if they've got a choice here. Now, uh, free will to me, as I said in our last lecture, is part and parcel of what it means to be created in the image of God. I, it's, I should say it's one of the principal things that makes us more like God than animals are like God because they don't have free will in the same way that we have it and that God has it. We're like God in that we have that free will. And uh, often skeptics will say about the tree in the garden, particularly the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, well, you know, the fact is, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, this just makes no sense. Why in the world would God do this? I mean, come on, after all, why would he, if he didn't want them to fall, just don't put the garden, just don't put the tree in the garden. That's how you prevent that, God. It almost just seems so made up and kind of fable-like, and um, it seems like it was all set up on God's part, too. Well, the fact is, um, they had a choice, and choice is very important, because without choice, you don't have the option, the opportunity to genuinely sacrifice. And if you don't have the opportunity to genuinely sacrifice, that means you can't give of yourself for the good of another. And if you can't give of yourself for the good of another, you can't love like you're supposed to love. See, love requires freedom. And one of the reasons, I mean, it's not very much love if I put a gun to my wife's head and demand that she marry me and demand that she treat me well and tell me that she loves me, I mean, that's not love. That's slavery of some sort. She'd be like a concubine or something and not even a happy concubine. Uh, on the other hand, uh, love, real genuine love, requires the ability to sacrifice, the ability to give of yourself for the good of another. So I submit to you, and you may have never heard this before, and it may strike you as odd. But I submit to you that you could not have had love between God and man um, or between man and, and others. You know, I mean, after all, that's what the law all boils down to is that we love God and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we would not be able to do that if there was not the potentiality to, uh, to, to serve self and to not uh, be sacrificial and to not obey and to not treat with love but rather to serve your own self-interests. You have to have, I, I think, that choice to, uh, to sacrifice for the good of another and to choose what you should that would benefit someone else um, more than yourself. And so I think that these two trees in the midst of the garden, 
uh, are very important for that reason, that you have genuine freedom of the will. And by virtue of that, you have a real possibility for love. All right. So uh, there's the trees. Let's move on and uh, continue looking at Genesis chapter 2. And I hope that you're enjoying this. Um, I'm speaking right now because I'm trying to fill up time until I get back to my place in the Bible. Because I'm shooting all over the Bible. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. Let's look at verse 10. Now a river flowed out of Eden to, the wa- to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of the land is good. The bdellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, I think the, point, the, the importance of uh, pointing out all of these act, actual rivers, and some of the rivers have obviously changed or gone away because of, uh, probably because of the flood. But I think the reason to point to some things that were still uh, features is because it tells us, I think, um, I think I heard Steve Gregg point this out, and I think he's right. It tells us that this is not just uh, a fictitious story. I mean, he's trying to give us actual landmarks to show you that this uh, this was an actual garden that existed in an actual place. And if you want to know where it existed, here's where it existed. You know, to try and instill in people's minds that this 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 is actual. This is something that actually happened, right? I, I think that's the point of giving us where this garden was. Because what would be the other point? I mean, it's not like you can actually go there now. Verse fifteen, although that'd be a good idea for a novel. Uh, Verse 15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden uh, of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Now we've covered some of this already, but um, my father and I were actually discussing just the other day. Here's Adam. He's the first man. He's never experienced, uh, he's never seen anyone experience death. He's never watched anyone die. How does he know what what I mean? What's the frame of reference here for Adam for what death is like? Why should he be concerned about this? Why should Eve have been concerned about it? Did that play into the eating of the fruit? You know what's going on exactly there? It reminds me of um, the legend of Siddhartha Gautama, who um, you know as the Buddha of Buddhism. And um, I, I, I should say this is the story of a false religion, and I don't take it to be true, but it, it, it is an interesting story nonetheless, that Siddhartha was the son of um, uh, two prominent people. His father was a king of a land, and uh, his father actually kept Siddhartha um, in a situation where he never saw aging, and he never was exposed to death, and he never was exposed to sickness. He just lived within the walls of the castle and never was allowed to see anything negative at all, anything like that. And even when Siddhartha's father, the king, got very old, he had a screen built so that when Siddhartha came into his father's presence, he wouldn't be able to look on his old and aging father. And then, of course, at some point, Siddhartha breaks free and goes around in the town and uh, for the first time encounters um, I, there are four things that are very important to Buddhism, but it's something like he encountered old age, sickness, um, uh, maybe a poverty, and uh, perhaps uh, a holy man. And I never understood why seeing a holy man would be horrifying if you've never seen one in the same way that sickness and uh, uh, poverty and old age would be. But um, he was horrified, and then he left and ran off and joined an ascetic group and all the rest, but we're not here to talk about Buddhism, but uh, this is kind of the situation that Adam was in. You know, he had never seen anything, and when he saw it, um, I think it was horrifying to him, Um, and, uh, but but you wonder what his frames of reference would be at this point. It'd be hard to say, and of course, what kind of death exactly this means, you'll surely die. Uh, The day that you eat from it, you'll surely die, because obviously Adam didn't literally die on the very day that he ate of the tree. So, We have to talk about that later. Verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground 
The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a, a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took the, one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. All right, now um, we see here that... <laughs> All these animals are brought before Adam, like, uh, like let's see if you're happy with this one. You know, I'm assuming that a dog must have been brought before Adam, but I don't know why he didn't find that to be a good helper, except for the fact that this is actually not just someone looking for a, a helper, or, or rather not just looking for a friend, but looking for a helper and a companion and a person with whom reproduction could take place. Uh, but also loneliness. You know, it's important to say that in marriage, some some cultures have gotten this wrong. Some cultures think that the only purpose uh, for men and women to have any sort of a relationship at all is just purely for the purposes of reproduction. Um, that stands behind some of the early polygamy practices. And that's how you avoided the problem of um, the inability to, to birth children with one woman. Well, you just go get you another woman and then you have... Um, a reproduction, right? Uh, but that's not the only purpose for marriage. Another purpose for marriage would be, and for the relationship between men and women, is companionship. Now, as others have pointed out, it's a special kind of companionship. And this is why we know that reproduction was important to this type of companionship. Um, have you ever noticed that when two men uh, are friends and they get mad at each other, uh, that problem can often be resolved a whole lot more easily than a man and a woman getting into an argument or two women having an argument. They can resolve that uh, argument more easily. Um, but when a man and a woman have an argument who are in love and in a marriage, that's a difficult, oftentimes that's a very sticky and difficult uh, problem to be resolved. So why didn't God just make another man uh, to be uh, uh, the companion for Adam? Well, because there was going to be also a sexual relationship here and reproduction was important. And also I would say that because both of these people now are going to represent dis different aspects of the image of God. And that means that they're going to be able to um, uh, uh, show the image of God in different ways. I remember a long time ago, um, I was talking with a very liberally minded young woman who was a friend of our family and we were talking about this very fact that men and women are different and that they bear different aspects of who God is. And she asked me what aspects I thought that women had that represented something about God that was more obviously the case with women than it was often in general with men. And the first thing that I said was compassion. And she was very offended by this and thought, oh, girl, oh yeah, of course, compassion. Yeah, women, uh, that's a woman's trait, compassion. And she was offended by this because she didn't like the idea of, um, I, I suppose, what she thought to be a weaker sort of a trait as being feminine and not masculine. Um, uh, but um, I, I find this to be just silly. Uh, obviously, women are often the ones who, who are more readily happy to show compassion and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, men are more likely to have other traits that, that, that are more masculine. And this does, I think, help us to adequately see the nature of God in these, uh, in this, in these differences that bring out uh, what God wants and what God thinks. <clears throat> and I think that's why sometimes the New Testament teaching that Jesus teaches is sometimes thought by uh, some to have, uh, or at least it used to be for sure, in ancient cultures to have you know, kind of a kind of be appealing to women, you know. Uh, that's hard for us to imagine now, but uh, the, all this talk about love in a certain way and, and men and women are equal and all this kind of thing, you know, it, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, but I think it does make sense, and men and women have uh, differences that are very important. And the Bible says here that God created woman. In verse 22, it says, The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. By the way, that works in the Hebrew as well. The, the word for man is involved in the word for woman. And then it says in verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right, so... <clears throat> So the woman is a suitable partner for the man. And they are very different. 
Obviously, for the purposes of reproduction, they're different. And I should say that the things that are different about men and women uh, physiologically are obviously the, the, the basic differences are differences that have to do with reproduction. You know, the, for the most part, men and women's bodies are the same. But the real estate, so to speak, that's different between them has to do with child rearing and reproduction. Not just reproduction, but reproduction and child rearing, if you think about that. I won't go into graphic detail, but that is the big difference. But there are also other differences that the Bible teaches are important that are related to those two separate genders. And this cannot be stressed enough, especially in the culture in which we live, where gender norms are trying to be uh, destroyed and um, everything that a woman can do, a man can do, and everything that a man can do, a woman can do more the latter than the first. You know, we're hearing all women can do anything that men can do. And what is this but blasphemy against the way that God created things? The biblical teaching is that men and women are equal in value. They are equal in value. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And the idea is that we are equal in value, but that we are different in our roles because we're just better suited for these different roles. This actually has some basis in science. Men uh, produce more testosterone than women do. Women produce more estrogen than men do. And whenever someone who considers themselves to be transgender and wants to look more transgender or wants to look more like uh, the opposite sex from which they were born biologically, they will op say a woman wants to look more like a man, then she will start taking testosterone injections. And she'll start growing hair on parts of her body where she wasn't growing it before. And she'll, have to have, she'll start to have other changes happen that we won't go into, obviously, for decency. And the opposite is also true. Men who take estrogen because they want to be a woman will then start to uh, have certain, not just physiological differences, but... Uh, they will have those. Uh, there'll be less body hair. They'll start to develop breasts and often in cases. And uh, But there are also uh, emotional uh, changes that happen and changes in the way you think. Uh, people who have l more testosterone are more aggressive. Uh, they have more muscle tone. They tend to lose weight more easily if they have more testosterone. Uh, they have more energy. It seems like they're better suited to work in physical labor, right? Uh, women, on the other hand, who have more estrogen uh, seem to have more of a sensitivity to people's emotions and there's more sympathy and empathy and things like that. I mean, these are just facts about the nature of reality. And we want to deny those facts in the world in which we live and pretend that they're not so and pretend that we can sleep with whoever we want to sleep with no matter what the gender of the person we're sleeping with is and we want to act like we can be whatever gender we want to be despite the fact that God made us a certain gender and all of those kinds of things. And what is that but blasphemy against the maker? You know, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, uh, it tells us that the invisible things of him, his eternal uh, uh, power and divine nature, have been clearly seen through what has been made. So that if you don't believe it, you are without excuse. Well, the fact is, that's, that's what we call general revelation. It's what you can know about God just from looking at the world around you without special revelation, which is what we call scripture or other types of revelation you might have. Uh, and the fact is that one of the most obvious aspects of general revelation is by looking at the physiology of men and women. I mean, literally looking at the, the, the structure of men and women. You can tell what the maker had in mind. And then by watching the behavior of men and women, you can see what God had in mind in terms of how they should function and act. Uh, my father used to preach, if you're a man, you ought, if you're a woman, you ought to look like a woman, you ought to act like a woman, you ought to walk like a woman, you ought to talk like a woman, you ought to be a woman, you ought to smell like a woman. If you're a man, you ought to walk like a man, you ought to talk like a man, you ought to act like a man, you ought to smell like a man, you know, whether that's good or bad, you ought to be a man. And um, that's offensive in our culture to suggest something like that. But should it really be? Shouldn't it just be what, I mean, isn't it what previous cultures have thought was just common sense? You know, some will say, well, that's barbaric, that's, um, that's not cutting edge, uh, 
Uh, you know, that's, that's, not, um, that's not the contemporary way. We are enlightened now. You know, we, we think of ourselves as enlightened on human gender and sexuality. But I've come to notice that, in, that the word enlightened seems to just mean whatever we're doing at the time. Because I think 200 years ago, people in America would have thought that uh, murdering your own children before they're ever born and making that legal and actually encouraging for the taxpayer to pay for anyone to do that whenever they want to and for people of the same gender to marry and sleep together and all those sorts of things, I think they, 200 years ago, would have thought that was not very enlightened. And they would have looked at what we're doing now as barbaric. And if that offends you, I'm sorry. I don't mean for that to offend you. I'm very... Uh, sympathetic and and um, I hurt for those people that are dealing with sexual desire toward people of the same sex or who feel that they are a different gender than the biology that they were born with. Nevertheless, um, we have to be if we if we're going to believe God's word, we have to believe what it says, even when it says things that we don't like and that we wish were otherwise. All right, um, and of course, then the roles of men and women are different. The, based on these things, based on the, the differences with which God made us. And that's fine. You know, um, uh, we see that played out in, in, the, in the writings of the New Testament. I referenced Galatians, but then uh, you know, the equality is there. But then in Ephesians 5, Titus 2, 4, Colossians 3, 18 through 19. And of course, uh, Jesus even uh, encourages this in talking about marriage. Matthew 19, 4 says, And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? It certainly seems like throughout the Bible we have the importance of gender and these differences and that there's a good reason for these differences. And when people try to act opposite to this, it is unhealthy physically. It can be damaging to culture, and it's just not what God designed. Um, I and some of the other uh, people that work at Trinity Seminary like to watch um, MMA fighting, you know, um, uh, the UFC and things like that. And uh, just over the past couple of years, women UFC fighters have come in. And the most popular used to be Ronda Rousey until she lost a fight against uh, Katie Holmes. But she was a UFC fighter. And it was often said, can anyone beat her? Could she beat the men? Could she beat any of these male UFC fighters? Well, (laughs) despite the fact that the women's liberation movement had a field day with that, she ultimately lost to another woman. But we can imagine she wouldn't win against a whole lot of the men, even though she is incredibly intelligent and perhaps maybe knows jujitsu better than even the men who know jujitsu. And the reason for that is because there's just a weight difference for one thing. I mean, just the, 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 the physiology of a man, uh, even those at the lowest weight class in the UFC, is just such that um, even with that, that martial arts knowledge, it's just going to be hard to, to confront someone who is made of all that muscle and sinew and, and bone. And it's just the structure is that much bigger and the aggression is more and all that. And now we've seen that played out actually now. And in fact, um, I remember not too long ago, oh, uh, a transgender uh, so it was a man who, uh, a physiologically a man who became a woman, so to speak, quote unquote, and then entered women's MMA and was just dominating. And again, the women were saying, look at this woman who is just a symbol of what women can do in MMA fighting and, and she's dominating everyone else. Do you know why she was dominating everyone else? It wasn't because she was a woman. It was because she happened to be a man. And all the things that go along with that enabled her to beat all of the other women. And I don't even like that I'm saying her because it's, it's, it's not someone who is a she. It's someone who has changed their gender <clears throat> using um, medicines and, and surgeries and things like that. Now, all of this may sound very misogynistic. Um, women oftentimes do better at things that we typically think of as male role things than men do. There are some women who uh, are pastors of churches who I actually think are better preachers than a lot of men that I've heard. Um, Some women in the military can perform as well as the men, or maybe it's imaginable that they could do better. You know, I'm not saying that a woman can't, in some cases, do better at some of these things than men. I'm trying to point out what I think God's idea was for the role. And pragmatics is not what's important here. What's important is what did God have in mind. If that's all offensive to you, I can't really apologize for it. I believe it's what Scripture gives us. 
And unfortunately, even men and women in the church today have been impacted by the societal messages that have been pressed upon us. All I can do is echo what Jesus said. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? I hope you'll join us next time as we'll take a look at Genesis chapter 3.